Great. We have quite a few people. Um, we are past 530, so I think that we should begin. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening um, to the January 6th Vigil for Democracy. My name is Shira Tarantino. I am an organizer for Pink Wave Action, and I'll be your MC this evening. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to thank our co-hosts from Indivisible Stanford and uh, WOW Women on Watch. Thank you so much for getting the word out there about this event. Uh, and if you haven't already, please mute your microphone. This session is being recorded and at the end of our program, we're going to have a brief Q and A. Um, Interspersed, during, uh, interspersed throughout tonight's program, we are going to have a set of call to actions between each speaker. And every time we have a call to action, we will post information for that singular action in the chat. So keep an eye on the chat. And at the end of our session, mailed to you will be a whole list of all of the call to actions together. So you don't have to scramble to write everything down. Um, we just wanted to do it in a, a short, digestible way. Well, January 6, 2021 was a very dark day for our democracy here in America. Today, we commemorate one year You're on mute. Shira, you're muted. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. How much of that did you not hear? <laughs> Just a sentence. OK. Um, today, we commemorate one year since the US Capitol was violently attacked by homegrown terrorists whose foundation of resentment against a free and fair election was built on falsities, uh, their rage bred by privilege, and their hate spawned by ignorance. Tonight, we mark this solemn occasion with a few words from some uh, very uh, well-spoken people, um, but also people like you and me who believe in the preservation of our democracy. And like I said earlier, interspersed throughout tonight's program, you'll receive specific calls to action. Please uh, pay attention to those and hopefully you'll be inspired by the actions as well as our speaker. Um, without further ado, I would like to, I'm very honored to uh, introduce to you uh, a champion of democracy right here in Connecticut, United States Senator from Connecticut, Richard Blumenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Shira. I am uh, really so excited by this evening's gathering and maybe most important by the call to action because that is absolutely what we need, action to protect democracy. And I just want to begin by giving you a, a sort of personal flavor of what Jim Himes and Chris Murphy and I and our delegation went through on that day. It was literally a physical assault. We were rushed from the floor of the United States Senate, told that we had to evacuate immediately. And we ran off the Senate floor as quickly as we could, accompanied by uh, the Capitol Police with their guns drawn. And we could see the rioters outside the Capitol with bats, and pipes, Trump flags, and Confederate banners. And we could hear them banging, shattering glass. Later, we could see the blood that was left. It was a physical assault on people. They wanted to kill us, literally. We were directly in the line of fire, and we were taken to a hearing room surrounded by troops with all the weapons that you find in modern combat guarding us against this assault. So the physicality of this threat and assault and the damage that they did, literally causing deaths, maiming people, obviously they defaced and debased the capital. Uh, and so there were some heroes on this day, as much as there were evildoers, 
uh, and lawbreakers, there were also heroes, Capitol Police, the National Guard, the DC police, but also I will tell you the maintenance people, the janitors, the people who cleaned up so that we could go back and we did go back to finish counting the vote that night because we were told, well, maybe you wanna go home. And we said, no, we wanna go back and count the vote. That's what they sought to interrupt. And it was, there's no sugarcoating it. It was an attempted coup, an attempt to stop the peaceful transition of power by rioters invited the Capitol by Donald Trump, incited to storm the Capitol by Donald Trump, but organized and funded by others and encouraged by leaders of that group, whether it's Rudolf Giuliani or Michael Flynn or members of Congress, they need to be held accountable, not just the lower level people, but prosecution should go up the chain of command. But here is the, the point that I really wanna to emphasize to everybody on this call. Your call for action is so tremendously important because as we commemorate and remember this dark and terrible day, one of the most abhorrent attacks on our democratic institutions, we need to recognize it was not an isolated or one-off event. That January 6th insurrection was a symptom and symbol of extremist violence, violent extremism, and domestic terrorism that has infected our nation. There is a through line here from Donald Trump and the big lie, the big lie being that the election was stolen, that it was fraudulently resulted in uh, Biden's victory, the big lie to violent extremism and white supremacy to voter suppression that we now see ongoing around the country. 33 laws have been passed by 19 states that drastically limit the number of people who can vote, the hours that they can go to the polls, the availability and access to mail-in ballot, and most important, the question of who counts, who counts the ballots, and can the results be overturned, which is exactly what they are now aiming to do by, in effect, eliminating the nonpartisan independent canvassing boards, giving power to legislatures and appointed commissions to, in advance, overturn the election. That's why we need to act on the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. These go to the core, the the very guts of our democracy. And that's why we also need to change the filibuster. I've advocated abolishing the filibuster since I came to the Senate 10 years ago. I was one of only 12 who voted to abolish the filibuster 10 years ago. But I've seen one after another of my colleagues come around to the point of view that we need to drastically modify, if not abolish filibuster, and certainly make some kind of exception for voting rights so that we can protect the democratic franchise. Uh, let me just conclude by saying, um, you know, um, I am haunted by the memories of that day. And it isn't just the physicality of the assault. It's how close we came to losing our democracy, literally how close we came to leaving the Capitol, being forced out of the Capitol without completing that vote count. That was their objective, to stop the vote count. And what happened on January 6th was just round one. It was round one in the struggle by the Republican Party to interfere with the democratic process, subvert it, sabotage it, prevent it from reflecting the will of the American people. And this call to action is one that has to be sustained and continued with the energy and the passion that you bring to today that I share 
And I am willing to do anything, go anywhere, speak to any group in any way I can to make sure that we mobilize the American people and preserve our democracy. That is what is at stake. And it's not just for us, obviously, it's for our children, for America in the future. Democracies are precious and they are fragile. They are very fragile and they are precious. And we need to mobilize the American people just as we are mobilizing on this phone call. And thank you so much to Stanford Indivisible. I understand Greenwich Indivisible is also represented. Uh, wow, Women on Watch to uh, uh, all of the groups that were involved, Pink Wave Action. Um, I, I'm surely leaving out some, I apologize. But to all of you who are involved, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really proud to join you and so grateful to have this opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Blumenthal. We really appreciate your time, your expertise, and your passion. Um, and thank you for addressing the filibuster as well, because several people had questions about uh, your thoughts on that. So thank you so much for being here. Now, what we're going to do is give you our first action. Your first action will be to call your senators and urge them to support the Freedom to Vote Act and to modify the filibuster um, to advance the voting rights bill. We demand voter empowerment and access, require disclosure of all political spending, uh, to ban partisan gerrymandering. We want them to support fair maps and prevent election subversion. Uh, so that's our first action. Now up, uh, our next guest, is committed to voter engagement and had registered thousands upon thousands of voters over the course of her tenure as former Secretary of State. And as a child of immigrants, she is committed to democracy, economic growth, and women's rights to safe, accessible, and equitable health care. Please welcome Connecticut's 109th Lieutenant Governor, Susan Beisowitz. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here with so many colleagues in public service, friends, and fellow activists. You know, we're gathered this evening, sadly not to celebrate, but to remember literally one of the darkest days in our country's history. Uh, and today I've been thinking about the police officers that were injured and were killed on that terrible day protecting our federal representatives and our Connecticut National Guard uh, went to help, as did many National Guards, men and women from around the country. And there it was, after one of the most secure and inclusive elections in American history, where insurrectionists propelled by President Trump and his supporters decided that instead of abiding by the election results, uh, an election that was fair and free, instead they would try to overturn the results of the election with a violent takeover of our democracy. It is simply just a domestic act of terrorism. And um, today and over the past months, we've been seeing that those who participated and urged participation in, this, in these acts of sedition are being prosecuted. And uh, I know the American people are watching and uh, they want to make sure that those insurrectionists are held accountable and are prosecuted to, and punished to the full extent of the law. Uh, there were people from our own state who were there and are in the process of being prosecuted. You know, um, I think what's lost in all of this is sometimes uh, what we all have in common. And I know we are living in a very uh, divided, polarized society, but what 
binds us is our common humanity. Our constitution envisioned a world that would be equitable and just for everyone in our country. And Governor Lamont and I every day fight for equality and opportunity for everyone in our beautiful state, no matter who they are or where they come from. And so today's a day where we should reflect upon what it is that we can do to uh, improve our country. And there are some things that each of us could do. And as I look at this very impressive array of almost 250 people, I know each of us are committed. So what can each of us do? Um, we can support candidates and elected officials who will do a very simple but powerful thing, uphold our laws and uphold our, our constitution. And we can be vigilant about our own democracy because in every legislative session, our democracy is under attack. And in every legislative session, there are initiatives to make our elections more fair, more open and more accessible to people. So we're gonna have the opportunity in the upcoming legislative session to make sure that absentee ballots are available to anyone who wishes to use them, particularly those who might be concerned about COVID or other public health threats. Um, we had that legislation through this November election. We don't have it now and we need it going forward. So there will be state legislation on that front. There are also two upcoming constitutional amendments to get rid of, um, no, uh, to ensure no excuse absentee ballot voting and uh, to ensure early voting or vote by mail. So look for the first constitutional amendment in, that will be on the ballot in November of 2022. And we can all support that initiative and then the following year, there will be another constitutional amendment to make our elections uh, more open and easier for people to uh, participate. Those are just a few of the things that all of us can do. Thank you so much for having me this evening. It's such an honor for the governor and I to represent you every day in Hartford. And I look forward uh, to working with all of you to making our democracy here in Connecticut um, more just and more fair. It's such an honor to represent you every day. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. We really appreciate your time. Um, and, and we're honored to be led by you. So thank you so much for being here. Um, our next call to action is action two. Again, we want you to call your senators and urge them to support the Protecting Our Democracy Act. We demand the reforms to prevent presidential abuses, restore checks and balances, strengthen accountability and transparency, and protect our elections. And again, you can check the chat for the links and remember that you'll get a full list of actions after the call is over. Um, right now, I would like to uh, introduce to you someone who is uh, a fierce advocate uh, for our rights, um, especially uh, for us in Connecticut um, as the 25th Attorney General. William Tonk's top priority is to protect Connecticut families residents and consumers, and he stands up to powerful forces that threaten us. Um, General Tong works every day to safeguard our civil rights and freedoms, uh, fighting hate, racism, protecting the rights of immigrants and LGBTQA communities, championing uh, reproductive freedom, and advancing equity across our state. He took a leading role in pushing back against the unprecedented federal overreach and attacks on the state's interests that 
threatened Connecticut residents in recent years. And as a constitutional scholar, he has also played a pivotal role with other state attorneys, uh, state attorneys general in protecting the integrity of our state and federal elections in the 2020 election. Please welcome Connecticut Attorney General William Tong. Thank you, Shira. And uh, it's great to be with you and all of the groups represented. Like Senator Blumenthal said, I won't get in trouble by naming everybody, but let me just say on behalf of myself, I know Governor Beiswitz feels this way and Senator Blumenthal and many others, we would not be here and we would not have the opportunity to serve all of you without all of your work, hard work, every single day, every single year and in every election season. So thank you so much. Um, today is a day for reflection. And um, I got the chance earlier today to spend some time with Senator Blumenthal Senator Murphy and the Secretary of the State, um, Denise Merrill. And as Senator Blumenthal and Senator Murphy were recounting the horrific days of January 6th a year ago, it, it occurred to me that we're very fortunate because in addition to being our senators, um, Senator Blumenthal and Senator Murphy are our friends, their fathers, their husbands. And they're very fortunate, and we're very fortunate that they returned home to their families after the horrific events of those days. And watching and looking, not just at the video, but the photos of Jim Himes and Congresswoman Deloro is still so chilling to all of us. Um, and, and it left a mark on all of us. And let us hope that that mark compels us to action. You know, I think so many of us mark our lives by things that happened when we were alive and we remember where we were when they happened. So my parents often talk about where they were, even though they grew up in Asia, they remember where they were when they heard that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. And, and people who grew up um, when I was growing up remember when the Challenger exploded and we all remember where we were on 9-11. And uh, I, of course, remember where I was on January 6th. I was in the office. But January 6th was the accumulation, as Senator Blumenthal said, of many events, many offenses against the Constitution and the rule of law, many incitements and encouragements to treason and sedition and insurrection. So for me, it wasn't, it isn't remembering necessarily where I was on January 6th, because I'm thankful and grateful that I was in my office safe in Hartford. But I remember just about a month before, um, when on a Friday night, my family and I went out to Stu Leonard's because we needed a Christmas tree. And it was late, we didn't have a Christmas tree and we were scrambling. And so Liz and I packed up the kids we went to Norwalk and we were walking around the parking lot looking at the picked over Christmas trees. And I got a phone call Friday night from the Deputy Attorney General, Peggy Chapel. And I said, what's up, Peg? She said, we gotta get back to work. And I said, Peg, it's Friday night. I gotta buy a Christmas tree. What's going on? And she said, we gotta get back to work. Texas and 17 other, 17 other Republican attorneys general have gone to the Supreme Court on an emergency basis, seeking to overturn the results of the presidential election. We have to get back to work. I never in a million years expected to receive that phone call. So I did what any father would do. I bought the Christmas tree. I put it on, I put it on top of the car. We drove home. And I got back on my computer and I got back to work. And thankfully, we stopped them in the Supreme Court in that craven political move to overturn the results of the election. But in case anybody has any illusions or doubts about where we were in that moment, we were looking into the darkness. We were at the edge of the cliff, we were looking into the abyss, whatever metaphor you want to use, we were there. And I know that because I had a front row seat 
to the breakdown of our democratic institutions. You may have heard that there was a plan, a plan that in states that President Biden won, but were controlled by Republican state legislatures, that there was a plan, notwithstanding the popular vote, to throw those electors to President Trump. In states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, they were trying to pull that off. We saw it play out in front of us on CNN and MSNBC and whatever news you were watching when President Trump was summoning legislative leaders from those states to come to the White House. He was trying to get the legislative leadership in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, to flip those electors for him in gross violation of law and of the Constitution. But because of activists like you in those states, what stood between those Republican state legislatures and the end of our democracy were four elected Democratic attorneys general and four elected Democratic governors. Now we came super close um, and, and those, those memories even now are, are triggering to all of us. And I wanted to share these stories because I wanted you to appreciate the gravity of this situation and this moment from my point of view. Because even though we stopped them then, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to stop them again. And that's why it's so important that we come together, mobilize, support our senators in passing far-reaching voting rights and election um, integrity legislation, that we do everything we can to make sure that 2020 Right, and the horrors of 2020 and the horrors of January 6 never happen again. As your attorney general, let me let me leave you with one additional thought. This is sort of a legal constitutional thought. We can never allow people who incite violence and treason and insurrection and sedition to get away with it. And I, I strongly encourage all of us to stand with our senators and the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice and support them, encourage them to hold everybody accountable. And if they can be proven to have incited violence and treason and insurrection, they should be prosecuted. They should stand trial. And they should not be able to hide behind the First Amendment. They should not be able to cloak themselves in their elective offices. If Josh Hawley incited people to violence and actively fomented treason, he should be held accountable. And so too Ted Cruz, and so too Donald Trump. And I think we need to stop tiptoeing around that question. You don't have a constitutional right to incite violence. The First Amendment, we all know, doesn't guarantee the right to shout fire in a crowded theater. It never has. And you don't have a constitutional right to encourage people to storm the Capitol, to engage in violence, to cause people injury, and to get them killed. And so <laughs> this, I think, is what is at stake for all of us. Let us accept the challenge of these great matters. Let us encourage people to do their full jobs and responsibilities and prosecute people who are responsible so that this never happens again. Thank you so much for the honor of being your attorney general. Thank you so much, E.G. Tong. And I can assure you that if we were live and in person, there would be rousing applause and screaming and yes, yes, hold them accountable. Um, unfortunately, we're not in person together, but um, we really felt your, uh, your words um, and it was quite chilling, your story. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, right now we have action number three. Action number three is call your senators and urge them to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act alongside 
the Freedom to Vote Act and HR 51, uh, the DC statehood bill, which we'll talk about later on in the program. They are the cornerstones of the necessary reforms that we need to be able to unrig our democracy and really genuinely make it work for every single person. Uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act will reestablish pre-clearance requirements, uh, which would help to prevent discriminatory election laws and provide protection against racist, racist voter suppression tactics. Um, so that is your action number three. Um, now, our, our next guest, I am so excited to have her on. She is an absolute trailblazer and an inspiration to many, uh, especially women and girls. Um, Mayor Caroline Simmons is the first woman to take the city of Stanford's highest office. And as the former state rep of District 144 in Stanford, which happens to be my district, she was and continues to be a champion for Stanford schools, um, small businesses, public safety, the environment, infrastructure, and also for inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility for all people. Uh, Mayor Simmons has devoted her entire career to public service, and we are so honored to have her with us on this solemn occasion. Uh, please welcome Mayor Caroline Simmons. Thank you so much, Shira, for that kind introduction and so honored to get to still call you a constituent and so many of you on this call constituents and just want to thank Indivisible Stanford and Pink Wave Action CT and, and all of you for uh, being on this call tonight, but also just for all the work that you do for our community. Um, I especially love hearing the, the action items in between speakers and just so reminiscent of how effective and organized and action oriented this group is. Um, I also want to thank uh, Lieutenant Governor Beisowitz, uh, Senator Blumenthal, and Attorney General Tong for your, your powerful words and, and leadership in our state. It's, it's really sobering and hard to believe that it was a year ago uh, that that horrific attack on our capital took place. And like all of us, I'll never forget where I was on January 6th. We were, um, I was joined by my legislative colleagues, many of whom are on this call. We were up at the Capitol actually getting sworn in uh, for our first day um, of the legislative session last year. And I remember starting to hear some rumblings via text message. I think it was my sister actually that first texted me, hey, did you see what's going on at the Capitol? And uh, I turned on my TV. We were all in our separate offices because of COVID. And as soon as I turned on the TV, I just couldn't believe my eyes um, and believe what I was watching take place. It almost felt like it was a coup taking place in another country. And it was just terrifying and shocking. And it was just so saddened for our country. And I think too, just the, the visual image of our capital in Washington, that beautiful symbol of our democracy being stormed was just so heart-wrenching and, and scary. Um, and then we were, of course, worried there were rumblings that state capitals were going to be targeted too. And so um, we were getting notifications and updates. And fortunately, the, the state capital in Hartford was, was safe. There were some peaceful protesters, um, but give a lot of credit to our, our state National Guard and our state police for keeping us all safe that day. Um, but I think more broadly, just thinking about this anniversary and, and what it means to me and to all of us, I think it's important to just reflect on how fragile our democracy is and how it's really up to each and every one of us every day to defend our democracy and to not take it for granted, which of course I, I don't have to tell this group because none of you do, um, but I just wanna express my gratitude to all of you for what you do to stand up for our democracy, um, whether it's getting engaged in, in elections, whether it's standing up for freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, free and fair elections, these sacred rights that are, are such a bedrock of our democracy that, that we're all challenged. Uh, on that day. Um, so, so thank you for what you do. I, I really believe local activism is, is the true bedrock of our democracy, citizen engagement, community members like you rolling up your sleeves to get engaged in our local elections, getting people registered to vote, making sure people turn out in elections and not just our presidential elections, but even our local elections. I'm so grateful for all of you who are so engaged in Stanford, working to make sure everyone has access to the polls, giving rides to the polls, getting people out even in these local elections is so important. 
And then also I'll just say as a mom too, I think it's so important that we pass on the message of the importance of civic engagement to our kids and to our grandkids. I'm, I'm constantly trying to teach my sons as they're of course too young to understand uh, these, these words of democracy and, and freedom. But I think starting to impart that on future generations is, is so important so that they don't forget and that they don't take for granted how sacred our democracy is. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all for the work you do every day. Uh, I couldn't be more honored to be Stanford's new mayor oh, and on, stop forgetting yourself. work with all of you to protect our democracy at all, all levels of government. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Mayor Simmons. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited to call you Mayor Simmons. It's, it's amazing. Um, and speaking of voting, thank you for um, bringing that up because our next call to action, action number four is, if your voting district is 144 in Stanford, you have a special election coming up because we need someone to fill Caroline's former seat. Um, the special election coming up is on January 25th. So if you are in 144, um, please mark your calendars. Uh, you can find your um, State House of Representatives uh, at the in the link in the chat. If you don't know whether or not you're in 144, you can check that link. Um, we only have 19 days till the special election, so please go out and vote. And you can also learn more about Hubert Delaney, who is the Democratic candidate for 144. Uh, also, I believe uh, somewhere in the link, somewhere in the chat. Um, I'm. Later on, I'm going to talk to you quickly about absentee voting, uh, but before I do, we are going to go to our next speaker. Our next speaker um, is Connecticut State Representative Stephanie Thomas, Connecticut, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Representative Thomas serves the 143rd District in Norwalk, Wilton, and Westport. She's a dedicated public servant. Um, she serves on the Commerce and Transportation Committees and is the Vice Chair of the Government Administration and Elections Committee. Welcome, Representative Thomas. Thank you, Shira. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here tonight um, and talk about Distinguished Company. We have, uh, it's been in the chat, we have the best leaders in Connecticut and I'm honored to be here. Um, Thank you, Indivisible Stanford, Pink Wave Action and Women on Watch for convening us and hosting this evening. Um, last year on this day, a very small group of people a mere fraction of America, a mob, a gang of right-wing militants sought to overthrow what I consider to be the very foundation of our democratic system, to overthrow what's most important to most of us, what we hold most dear, this understanding that by casting our vote, we get to decide the outcome of elections. And if you're like me, you heard a lot today about um, how so many members of Congress feared for their own lives, um, how one man's ego sought to usurp our democracy, how some of those elected to uphold the Constitution are still working in service of our former president in ignoring the rule of law. But tonight, I'm not giving them any more airtime. And instead, I'm going to focus my remarks on you, on us, because I think sometimes it's good to be reminded that we are the government. In my opinion, what transpired on the 6th cannot be viewed as the result of one man's efforts or even the culmination of one presidential term. In 1789, when George Washington was elected our first president, more people were left off the list of, vote, um, of voters qualified to cast a ballot than were on it. And in 1876, our president was selected by the electoral college system rather than by national popular vote. And as we know, that happened again and again and again, most recently, when Donald Trump lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton, yet became our 45th president. 
In 2004 and 2006, Facebook and Twitter launched, and today these largely unregulated companies have over 2 billion and 400 million users respectively. And stick with me, a few more facts. <laughs> In 2008, the Census Bureau predicted a minority majority population by the middle of this century. And a recent Pew study found that 59% of Republicans and 42% of Democrats said that a majority non-white population will weaken American culture. And in more recent decades, only about 60% of those eligible to vote voted in a presidential election and only about 40% during midterms. Even in very high turnout years, such as 2018 and 2020, the United States lags compared to many other developed nations. So much has transpired since our nation's founding, which has led us to where we are today. Alienated, fearful, obstinate, intractable. But believe me when I say that you can make things right, that together we have the power to make things right. We can educate ourselves about candidates and how elections work we can make it a point to vote in every single election and make sure everyone else can do the same. We can run for office, encourage others to run, volunteer and donate to those who are running. We can engage with our family and friends and even coworkers in honest dialogue instead of leaving political discourse to comments on social media. We can protect our elected leaders by speaking out against hate instead of normalizing hate speech as part of what we signed up for. We can fight against sexism, racism, individualism, all the isms. We can treat social media as the entertainment platforms they are rather than as arbiters of truth we can stop saying that what is happening around the country is not happening in Connecticut. And we can refuse to believe that our democracy is crumbling and instead work to shore it up. On January 6th, our former president said in a speech that day, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And he used that speech to inspire violence and murder, to foment fear, to subvert our constitution. But I'm using it here tonight to remind us that the majority of Americans did not show up at the Capitol that day to inspire you to get involved if you're not involved, to stay involved if you're already involved and work to protect our democracy and to encourage you to do everything you can, truly everything you can to ensure that we have a representative government through election and voting reforms that will bring more voices to the table. I think that until each of us can say, what can I do? More than we say what they are doing to us, we will not win, we, we won't win. You've heard tonight what our elected officials propose. You've heard many actions that we can all do. Next, you'll hear from voting rights advocates about their efforts. But all of us, we need your help. And not just today, we need it every day. We need it again and again and again and still again. It is our responsibility as citizens to believe that we can be better than this and then act each and every day to make it so. Um, so I hope tonight serves as a rallying cry to protect our democracy, one in which we, the people, get to decide the outcome. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Representative Thomas. We really appreciate you and Absolutely, I concur on all of that. We're, we're a team, um, you know, it, it, it won't take just one of us, it'll take all of us. So absolutely, thank you.
Um, our next action, uh, the fifth action so far that we have this evening is call your US representative and ask them to support the DC statehood bill. Uh, the proposed Commonwealth of Douglas would see us two new senators and give the people of DC fair representation. Um, next up, my friend, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Perlo is an uh, election reform and gun violence prevention activist who lives in Greenwich. He co-founded and leads Voter Choice Connecticut, the citizens group working to bring ranked choice voting to our state. Since the 2016 election, he's been active in efforts to protect and expand voting rights and strengthen our democracy, including the successful grassroots effort to get Connecticut to join the National Popular Vote Compact. For his day job, uh, Jonathan is Director of Communications for Connecticut Against Gun Violence. Uh, Jonathan Perlow is a round the clock advocate Welcome, Jonathan. Well, thank you so much, Shira. And I am truly humbled to be following such an incredible lineup of um, public servants and elected officials who I admire so much. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, as Shira mentioned, my name is Jonathan Perlow and I am co-founder of Voter Choice Connecticut, um, which is the citizens movement working to bring ranked choice voting to our state. One year ago, as others have recognized, we witnessed a nearly incomprehensible attack on our democracy. A sitting president, his supporters, and numerous members of Congress tried to overturn an election with a deafening silence from the vast majority of other leaders in his party. But the attack on our democracy didn't end with the certification of the election the next morning, and it goes way beyond the big lie. It lives on in a concerted effort by elected officials, including here in Connecticut, to sabotage our democracy. So it's up to every one of us to defend it. But what does that mean? It means working to protect and strengthen what I consider to be the four pillars on which our representative democracy rests. The first is ensuring that it's easy to vote. The second is expanding the franchise to all citizens. The third is protecting election integrity. But the foundation of our democracy isn't complete without a fourth pillar which is to ensure that election outcomes result in politicians that truly represent the electorate, the will of the majority. Connecticut has made important strides in strengthening all four of these pillars, especially this past year. We're making it easier to vote by moving forward with, a ballot, with ballot resolutions to amend the state constitution. We expanded the voter franchise by giving individuals on parole the right to vote. We strengthened election integrity through years of work by our Secretary of State to harden our election infrastructure against cyber threats. And this year we made an important step forward in delivering more representative election outcomes, the fourth pillar I talked about, by joining just a dozen or so states that have ended prison gerrymandering. Um, and as uh, Shara mentioned and a couple of people I've seen it um, in the chat, um, after the 2016 election, Connecticut finally joined the National Popular Vote Compact, which once enough states sign on, will guarantee the presidency to the candidate with the most popular votes. Once that happens, no longer will the nation's leader be chosen by a minority of voters in a handful of battleground states. Um, and the reason I mention the, the National Popular Vote Compact and Connecticut passing it is um, joining the compact was really a testament to the power of grassroots engagement. The bill had been languishing in the General Assembly for a decade, and it finally passed only after citizens got involved following the 2016 election and led the effort. Although Connecticut achieved more in democracy reform last year than at any time in our recent history, much remains to be done. The top priority is making sure the ballot resolution to allow for early voting passes this coming November. So please remember as the election comes up in November to tell your friends to vote yes on the resolution to allow for early voting. And we must remain vigilant about election integrity, not against the virtually non-existent threat of voter fraud that underlies the big lie, but rather against partisan interference with counting votes and certifying elections. Attempts were already made by Connecticut Republicans last year to take aspects of election oversight away from the Secretary of the State and put it in the partisan hands of the legislature. 
schemes that have been passed into law elsewhere. We can't let that happen here. And one way to protect ourselves is to elect a secretary of the state who will follow in the steps of Secretary Merrill, who has long been a champion of election integrity. And you should definitely get to know some of the candidates that are running for secretary of the state who are on this call tonight. Lastly, we must continue to adopt reforms that make election outcomes more representative. One that I encourage you to learn about and talk to your legislators about is ranked choice voting. At its essence, ranked choice voting gives you more of a say in who gets elected, even if your first choice has a little chance of winning. With RCV, you no longer have to decide between voting for the candidate you truly admire versus the one who has the best chance of winning against your least favorite candidate. If you'd like to learn more about this election reform that the American Academy of Arts and Sciences recommends as a key strategy for improving equality of voice and representation, please use the link in the chat to subscribe to our Voter Choice Connecticut emails. Um, just in closing, early in my career as an activist, which um, doesn't go back very far, uh, six, seven years, a friend gave me a magnet with a quote from John F. Kennedy. It read, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. I firmly believe that. And if you haven't experienced it firsthand, please get involved and see for yourself. Not only is it essential if we are to defend this democracy of ours, it's immensely rewarding. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I, I think that people learn so much. Um, Though they will learn so much from uh, ranked choice voting, and it's a, it's a really important, um, really important action. And I'm trying to find it on my on my notes. Here we go. Ranked choice voting um, is your next call to action. Learn more about it at Voter Choice Connecticut. Uh, please subscribe to their email list. You'll see that in the chat coming up, and learn why ranked choice voting is truly a must have uh, for election reform. Now, uh, next up, we have um, a very special person whom I really like, Bianca Shin. She has extensive experience in the field of social services, public health and education. She previously served as investigation social worker with the Connecticut State Department of Children and Families and minister counselor at the permanent mission of Haiti to the uh, United Nations. She also previously served as the Director of Family Advocates at a local charter school, and her interest in the field of public health and education includes adolescent health, urban trauma, and impact of parent engagement. She's currently employed by Domus Kids as an Associate Data Strategist. Bianca, right now, uh, is currently the co-chair of Stanford Health's Patient and Family Advocacy uh, Advisory Council, and is also a member of the Stanford Vaping Tank Force. She's involved in her local League of Women Voters and also on the state board. Uh, she's a member of the Parent Leader Training Institute, PLTI. And basically, Ms. Shin is committed to advocacy and ensuring that the voices of the most vulnerable are echoed loud. Uh, she takes special interest in voter engagement among young people of color. And her motto, we have to plan with them and not for them. Inclusion matters, uh, really, really speaks to my heart. Um, Bianca, um, please, uh, please welcome Bianca Shin. Thank you so much for being here today. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I would like to say a special thank you to you, Shira, and Brooke and Michelle for um, hosting this vigil because it's very much needed um, and it we need to be reminded about this so it's not swept under the rug. Uh, a year ago, um, ironically, I was uh, in, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, sitting and meeting about voters, about the election in Haiti that was, um, that was three years behind. So as we're sitting with the colleagues from the UN and other organizations talking about elections in we hear a news flash, coup d'etat, coup d'etat. We're like, wait, oh my God, the Haitian government's having, what, what's going on? Ironically, no, they were talking about the United States when we, saw the, when, we, when we saw the news flash on CNN. And I'm like, no, that's a lie. That can't happen in the United States. That is not true. But as the, Im, the uh, images were coming through, I was like, wait, that's the Capitol Hill. 
oh my God, these are symbolic institutions that are under attack. Um, and at that moment, I, you know, I felt vulnerable because coming from being a daughter of, of uh, Haitian immigrants, my family, my mom came to this country and voted when she was 45 years old. In her country, she wasn't allowed to vote. There, elections happen when it, ha when it at, at, sometimes every five years, every 10 years. You can go a decade without having elections in, um, in Haiti and being under a dictatorship. So, um, you know, it was seeing that I felt vulnerable. I'm like, no, I, not the America that I know, not the country that I always take the uh, privilege and the honor of voting every year in election, whether it's five minutes in line, but feeling safe and not having to feel that it might be my last time voting because a bullet might fly through my head or someone is going to take my um, votes away from me. But as I watch the insurrection, Insurgent, or- That's the word. Oh. That's, I was like insurgents, but it's insurgents. Oh. Sorry. Or um, as in the other parts of the world, it's called the coup d'etat. An attempt, it was an attempted coup d'etat to over, the word coup d'etat means an overthrow. What they did, a group of people planned because you, this was not unplanned, as we all know, to take the vote of the majority and to silence our voices. And as a woman of color, what that also reminded me of, it was the racist sentiments, the images, the um, symbol, symbolism that was projected on that screen. And although it happened a year ago, in our lives, especially people of color and many, and throughout the other world, in, the, the insurrection occurs. Um, it may not be so vivid as it, as it happened on that January 6th, but it's happening through policies, through ways to shut us down by not allowing us to vote. When you have a United States Congress in 2022, here in the United States of America, where we are the big brother, the leaders, as someone who's uh, sat in rooms with other world um, diplomats, I can tell you, this insurrection has placed our government staff, people who are working to fight for this country in the, dipl in the diplomatic field, in other fields, at risk. Because guess what? Our words are no longer as solid as, as, as it used to be because it's, it's, it was watered down. You, what we're hearing, especially from people who are working on the battleground, whether you were in the military, go go um, figure it out in your own country because you almost had a coup d'etat. Um, how are you going to tell us how to run our country about voting and respect human rights when the human, when our elected officials in the United States have not, one, the people that have planned um, this um, insurrection have not been held accountable. And here we are, um, champions of human rights, but we have our people who planned an attack on a nation, on its sovereignty, on its people. And there were barely any, um, any accountability. So when we, I, I think on, I think I'm, I think we have about, about 250 participants. I think people in this room tonight, uh, per, um, their kids are more accountable. They're in, their staff are more held accountable than the elected officials and the other people who participated in this coup. Um, what I want to also um, highlight in this is that these anti-democratic attacks, I think it was uh, State Representative uh, Stephanie Thomas who mentioned, this did not happen and um, did not start um, with Donald Trump. It started before and it just bubbled up to the top in 2021. What we, have to, what we have to acknowledge now is that we have to mobilize and mobilize. Connecticut is not a safe state. It is safe today because of the legislators we have. We are one election away from chaos. And I am not being an alarmist. I'm not being a pessimistic. We think about it, Connecticut, we still are not in the process. We're, we're finally getting in the process with early voting. Think about that. If we're so progressive or some of us think we're more liberal than others in certain aspects, we're not. And I, and I wanna um, highlight that um, when I say mobilize, mobilize. And how do we do that? 
look around the table. And as you're talking about democracy, about making change, look around the table, bring other people in that may not look like you, that may not have the exact values. Democracy does not happen with one group. It has, it, it's, it happens with all. You cannot have a found, a, a safe and um, democratic, safe, strong democratic foundation without all hands on deck. So that means if you're talking about disability and voting rights and how to provide more access, we have to make sure the right people who are enduring, who have those are in the room. If we're speaking about women of color, if you're always talking to one, try to find two. Bring more people in, in the room, more perspectives so we can have a solid democracy for the next 2000 years. Um, and I just want to say that um, it's a pleasure. And I really say this, um, Shira and Brooke and Michelle, thank you for hold, hosting this because this is important. We, most of us, if you did not host this, I just landed on a plane from Haiti <laughs> talking about an election. I would have probably been watching it on CNN, but I would have been inspired by President Biden's words, but I'm more inspired by the people that I am connected in, on, this, on this Zoom because I know you guys are local. I can reach you via phone through Shira or Brooke or Michelle. So that means I feel like I'm more safe because I have a community. I'm not looking at, a, um, at, the, at the Washington community, but I'm looking at whether it's the community from Greenwich, New Canaan, Stanford. I feel supported. And I think that the, the, for our generations that in the, in the next elections that we're having, that we have to continue to mobilize and mobilize and mobilize. It's not during, last thing I promised to um, end, we have to move away from mobilizing in July for an election that's in November and asking certain groups to vote. What are they going to vote if they do not know who their elected officials, what the issues at stake? And we should not act as if we know more than certain groups of what issues at stake. My particular issue at stake is women's rights. My neighbor next door might be childcare. So we have to understand that and change our model and engage early. Early engagement will, will definitely um, put us on the right trajectory. And I thank you again, everyone, and have a good evening and let's uphold democracy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bianca. And um, your perspective is so important. And yes, I absolutely agree. We need to uh, stretch our uh, diverse boundaries of diversity. Absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad you were able to join us. We, we didn't even know if Bianca was able to join us because, you know, she was in the airport and she, we didn't know. Um, so it's, it's been a blessing. So thank you so much for being here and uh, for, for us to hear your words is wonderful. Thank you. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to quickly talk to you about absentee ballot information. Uh, the executive order for the COVID excuse on the absentee ballot application has expired. So for those of you who are voting in the special 144 election, um, you won't be able to check off COVID and you will have to vote in person. However, voters that can still vote absentee must attest to uh, one of the other excuses that are included on the regular ballot, um, which you'll see in the link in the chat. Uh, ballots are available at the town clerk's office. And um, so you can vote there now rather than using the mail or drop box. And for in-person voting, polls will be open on January 25th from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. And for more detailed information, you can see all of those links in the chat. There's so, there's so much information. All right. Um, now, before we, before we, um, no, actually, um, yes, actually, you know what? Our next action is to watch this video. We have a very urgent message from Jim Himes and Michelle is going to key up that video in just a second. So sit tight and listen in.
just give us a few minutes. Thank you all for your patience. Can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Particular what happened. Okay. Hi, I'm Congressman Jim Himes, and I want to thank the Stanford Vigil for Democracy for commemorating what happened to all of us, in particular what happened to those of us who were in the Congress on that fateful day, January 6th, a year ago. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but I will also tell you that I thank you because I actually think that our democracy is more at risk today than it was on January 6th. Uh, and I was in the chamber. I was one of the last out of that chamber, along with my neighbor, Rosa DeLauro, uh, and we watched the insurrectionists try to beat down the door. We saw them up close uh, as we were taken from the chamber. We heard the gunshot that killed one of them. Uh, and nonetheless, as shocking as that day was, it was never going to succeed at ending democracy in this country. But what has happened since might. And what has happened since is three things. Number one, the ex-president of the United States shockingly continues to try to persuade people that he won the election and that this current president, President Biden, is illegitimate. Even more shockingly, and this is the second thing that keeps me up at night, according to polling, two thirds of Republicans in this country believe that despite a shred of evidence that there was any fraud in the election, two thirds of Republicans believe that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. It's hard to exaggerate how much of a threat to our democracy that is. And third, and equally concerning, all over this country, but particularly in swing states, the Republican Party is working hard to remove the authority of professional uh, and civil election monitors. People like Brad Raffensperger, who courageously, despite being a Republican, stood up to the president's demand that he find votes in Georgia. All over this country, Republican legislatures are taking decisions out of the hands of the Brad Raffensperger's and giving it to partisan legislatures. This is a profound danger to 2024. So thank you for organizing. Thank you for mobilizing. We need to work every single day to buttress those institutions like our media, like our community organizations, like groups like this one that will stand up for our democracy. Because I hate to say it, and as happy as I am that uh, my colleagues were safe on January 6th, the threat to our republic remains. That's it. Okay, thank you so much, Jim Himes. Um, that was chilling and urgent message and we have a lot of work to do. So um, we, have, we have almost no minutes for Q&A, but I know that there are some questions that people uh, want to ask. So if you have, we'll, we'll just do a few minutes of that. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, here, okay, so um, here's our first question. A lot of feedback. Somebody's telling me I have a lot of feedback. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm getting some yeses. Okay. Sounds um, like you're shuffling papers. Shuffling the paper, oh, yeah. Paper. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have my I have my notes. Um, now, Michelle, did you want to ask these questions or? Sure, I can do that. Um, can you enter the phone? Oh, uh, actually, yes, um, but I don't, uh, Brooke. I don't know who's gonna to answer them. Yes, who's gonna answer them? Um, we have a lot, a number of our um, people no longer on. No longer. Um, oh, Caroline is ready. Okay, so you know what? Um, Caroline is on uh, for a quick minute. We are just going to go to Mayor Caroline Simmons and she has a proclamation to read. Uh, Mayor Simmons, are you with us here? If she's not on, she's getting on. So she's just getting on. Give her one second. <laughs> okay. Maybe Thank you about technical difficulties, but okay, we're having a few technical difficulties at the end, but it was pretty smooth. 
<laughs> for most of the hour, which is great. Um, just give us a quick second. Thank you all so much for your patience. We should give a shout out to um, who all of our participants who are who, who speakers and otherwise. Absolutely. Um, firstly, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, we know that when we get off the call, you will be um, following our calls to action over the coming days, weeks, and months. Um, we also wanted to thank all of our uh, guest speakers, Senator Blumenthal, uh, Representative Himes, Susan Beisowitz, uh, Attorney General Tong, um, and also we have some dignitaries here uh, listening. We have um, State Senator Matt Blumenthal, uh, State Senator David Michelle, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not State Senator, <laughs> Representative, uh, State Representatives, Blumenthal and Michelle. We have uh, State Representative Thomas, of course, um, and also Matt Lesser. Thank you so much for coming. Of course, Mayor Simmons. Um, we also have Ramaya Shaw, who is on the Stanford Board of Representatives, and our town clerk, Lita Ruder. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, Mayor Simmons, uh, do you have a, uh, do you have a, um, would you like to come on now? Do you have time yes yes oh, absolutely. wonderful <laughs> I, I apologize for for the delay and i uh, do have a proclamation from the city that uh i'd be be honored to read uh so and this is our first official proclamation uh giving out so uh this proclamation declaring january 6 2022 as a day of remembrance and action Whereas the city of Stanford is committed to promoting voting legislation that can safeguard our democracy while con condemning the actions of elected officials who sought to betray our nation on January 6th. Whereas on January 6th, a faction of elected officials turned their backs on America by inciting armed militants to attack our capital and then tried to block an investigation to cover up their role in this deadly violence. Whereas the attacks are incessant one year later and the same faction that attacked our country on January 6th are working to restrict our freedom to vote, attack fair voting districts and prepare for future attempts to sabotage free and fair elections. Whereas evidence is showing that some elected officials aided in planning, spreading lies about the 2020 election to keep their supporters engaged and enraged. Whereas the importance of investigative work of the January 6th Select Committee must continue so that our elected officials and the public understand what really happened on January 6th and prevent future attacks on the peaceful transfer of power. Whereas coming together, we can prevent another January 6th attack and realize the promise of democracy for all of us, no matter our race, culture, color, creed, religion, national origin, gender, mental and physical ability, age, marital status, family structure, citizenship status, sexual orientation, sexual expression or identity, economic status, veteran status, zip code, income, the intersectionality of any or all of the aforementioned identities and any other protected class in confirmation with federal, state, and local laws. So we all have an equal say in the decisions that shape our daily lives and futures. Whereas January 6th, the National Day of Activism will bring together local coalition partners to raise awareness and create energy around protecting our democracy and condemn actions of anti-democratic militants. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Stanford will work jointly with coalition partners to inform Americans to protect our democracy and reprimand attacks on our democracy and, and urge all citizens to join with us in safeguarding our democracy and call all on elected officials to pass necessary legislation to protect our democracy. Proclaim this day of January 6, 2022. Sorry, that was a mouthful. And thank you all so much for thank all the work you you're so doing and honored to be with you. Tomorrow. Thank you so much, Mayor Simmons. That's so meaningful to be um, given a proclamation for this day, um, <clears throat> this very solemn day. So thank you so much. I also wanted to, um, say that before we go, thank you to our sponsor, Pulse Content, for the 
technology of everything, well, I wouldn't know what to do without you. So thank you very much. And a very special thanks to our behind the scenes organizers, Michelle Apt and Brooke Manuel. Thank you so much. Also thanks to WOW Women on Watch and um, Indivisible Greenwich for spreading the word. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, and of course, Indivisible Stamford and Pink Wave Action volunteers and all of the people that helped to make tonight happen. And of course, thanks to all of our illustrious speakers. Um, we were going to have a Q&A, but most of our um, experts have, have gone and I am, I am not equipped to answer questions about the Electoral College. I'm just, I'm just, the, I'm just a vessel. <laughs> So, um, but thank you so much. And oh, one more thing, a shout out to our friends at Action Network of Darien Democrats, who like us had to cancel our in-person vigil, which was heartbreaking, but only for a second because nobody wants to get sick. So thank you so much all for understanding. And um, the AND Network has 30 Unite for Democracy masks because they didn't hold their in-person vigil mass to give away. So please check the chat for the information on how to contact the organization and to receive a mask, um, first come first serve, of course. And thanks Randy for that. Um, so good night, everyone. Please stay healthy and safe. And again, we appreciate you all. Thank you. Have a great evening.